They picked up uh, uh, several guns and they were able to begin um, raiding, passing traffic and to recruit people. And the dark regime was hampering uh, aid for breaching actually the, especially the countryside. It was terrible. It is harvest season in Tigray, northern Ethiopia. And the wheat is heavy with seed. One of the world's oldest known farming areas, the Ethiopian highlands, have served as the region's grain basket for centuries. And in many fields, wheat is still harvested the old-fashioned way, by hand. But new strains of wheat have increased yields and this farmer is looking forward to a good year. From the countryside to the cities, Ethiopia is in the middle of the biggest transformation in its long history. Cycles of drought and famine have long played a role in Ethiopia's politics. In 1974, a terrible famine resulted in the overthrow of Emperor Hel Selassie. His death at the hands of a ruthless military dictatorship ended a long line of emperors going back to King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. But the bloody crackdowns of Mengistu Haile Mariam's military regime Old Derg sparked a new wave of rebellion. <laughs> Among the rebels, a smart young man from Tigray called Meles Zanawi. Initially, the rebels were given little chance of success. At 14, Meles won a scholarship to a prestigious school named after World War II guerrilla warfare expert, Ord Wingate. Instead, Meles Zenawi would sacrifice that future for another, emerging from the long years of rebellion as a skilled and pragmatic politician. These were urban boys who had been raised with some privilege in Addis Ababa, and to find themselves living out in the hills of Tigray with no money, with no resources, in fear of their lives, relying on uh, the local peasantry to sustain them, and yet to continue the ideological debate, because I know that that happened. It's an extraordinary legend. This handful of students brought their ideas out into the wilderness of northern Tigray, and that they relied on the local peasantry to feed them, to sustain them, until they decided that it was time to begin the insurrection and they did this by raiding one uh, police station where they picked up uh, uh, several guns and they were able to begin um, raiding, passing traffic and to recruit people.
It was in the mountains of Tigray that Aidan Hartley, then a young reporter for the news agency Reuters, got to know the rebels and Mellers. I met uh, a very unassuming, quite young man. Um, he looked like a cafe au lait uh, Lenin, and he was smoking heavily. That's what I remember from my first meeting with him. Um, and um, I had no idea who he was. And he said, my name is Mali Zanawi, um, and you're going to go to Tigray um, starting tomorrow, and good luck. While Meles himself was little known to the outside world, his grasp of both ideology and military tactics had already elevated him to the top ranks of the rebellion's secretive leadership circles. <laughs> When he was uh, running a guerrilla group in the mountains of Tigray, he knew that the most effective way to rule was through the authoritarian apparatus of a Marxist-Leninist League of Tigray. And he knew by the time that he arrived in Addis Ababa that he had to speak the language that would make sense to the West and the international community. But he did it in a very charming way. He announced to the world that he had enrolled in a correspondence course um, learning economics. But it was in these mountains of Tigray that another event would unfold, one which would get the world's attention. This was a situation in Tigray during the dark period, the suffering of the people, and uh, the drought, war, and all that. The dark regime was hampering uh, aid for breaching, actually, the, especially the countryside. It was terrible. This is me. I don't know. <laughs> Tiwodros Hagos was an early comrade of Meles in the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front, or TPLF. It was not easy. It was very, very tough, especially during the uh, when the organization was small. It had to strive very hard to, for its survival, and eventually, uh, since the cause it was fighting for was a cause which the people were supporting, the people started support it. Actually, eventually, the people became part of the struggle as a whole. Caught in a famine and between warring armies, it was the peasants whom the rebels relied on for support that suffered the worst during the famine of the 1980s. People that had become my family, the small-scale farmers on whose uh, generosity I and many of my colleagues depended for our daily bread, uh, they were very severely affected and that affected our movement also. Thousands died while the Doug, who could have helped, did little. News reports on the famine helped launch one of the biggest aid efforts ever. Uh, it came a bit late, but uh, it did serve to uh, save uh, millions of lives because the international community responded very quickly and very generously to the uh, famine. In May 1991, Derg forces disintegrated and within days, rebel forces, including Malice, TPLF, captured Addis Ababa. But the secretive habits of a rebel leader remained. An extremely private man, his reasoning and that of his party has always raised questions. To get to the bottom of the character of Melez and of his, uh, of his guerrilla group, his party, his movement, you have to go up into the northern Ethiopian highlands. Adwa, Melez's hometown in Tigray province, provided some of the strength that made him an effective warrior. It is the location of a famous defeat of an Italian colonial army in 1896. And they were defeated and driven back through Eritrea. That is through Masawa. And they left. Fiseha Zanawi and his friend, Fanas Bire, have come to look at the valleys outside Adwa where the battle took place. 
first in the Ethiopian history, a white man was captured by the black people. Oh, it is not only for the Ethiopian people, for all the black people to defeat well trained army. It is a big victory, you see. It is a big history. And they have kept their country for a long period of time, independently. The town that Meles Zenawi experienced as a child can still be recognized in the Adwa of today. A short walk from the family home is an Ethiopian Orthodox church whose complex and ancient ceremonies begin each day at 5 a.m. The spirituality he experienced here helped Meles make the transition from warrior to statesman, from someone whose responsibility went from taking his enemies' lives to making his fellow citizens' lives better. Perhaps that's a metaphor that describes um, how Ethiopian society could withdraw up into its mountain fastnesses. They're dry, deforested, hauntingly beautiful. Um, these extraordinary steep-sided mountains known as ambers, like Inselbergs, something out of uh, uh, a fantasy movie. Um, you get the sense that this is a landscape that has been tilled for many centuries. It's, it's a landscape that feels almost medieval, where you meet um, Christian hermits, um, where you see ancient tombs, extraordinary um, monuments to um, former kingdoms of sun worshippers, of, of Jews, of Islam, of Christianity. The town of Adwa is typical of the region. New buildings dot the roadside, but it's a byway of the old town that holds the Zenawi family home. He was really born in the south, and uh, he learned up to grade 8. Then after grade 8, there was an exam, scholar. he got scholarship uh, to General Wingate School. When he was in childhood, uh, his hobbies were uh, one swimming, next reading books. From childhood he was reading so many books. So I think uh, his, if you read too much, you get too much knowledge, you know, to whom to help. He was not born for himself and for his family. He was selfless. So I cannot say that he... He was not born for himself. I was built first around here. So we can say this is the oldest part of the town. This is, they have already left it for museum, as a museum, old town. Something that clearly has changed is the water level in the rivers where the boys used to swim. This, uh, this is one of the rivers 
where he was swimming when he was a childhood. Uh, now it's a little bit dry. Before it was uh, as full as this part. Now it's a little bit dry. But uh, when we were uh, kids, it was not like this. It, the water was uh, very full up to this one. And he used to swim around here. But now almost all because of the drought, because of you know, the climatical condition, most of the rivers are dry. Years later, Meles Zanawi would champion Africa's efforts to mitigate climate change. We need to do um, more work uh, in terms of irrigation and encourage these uh, pastoralists to settle. That takes time because uh, the livelihood of the population is based on livestock and movement around. Uh, and it's not easy to change their um, attitude towards uh, settled farming. The uh, drought has been more acute uh, in the east. Uh, I think this is related to uh, climate change. The climatologists have been telling us that uh, the rest of the country, the highland area of the country, is likely to get wetter. Then Africa killed the birth of 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 كأقدم جميرو تبقى أسرع حتى كم سرعة لقينا بعالم دار الجونة في اللاتي ولا دير الكلام يكفر من زبال. Elected Prime Minister in the first ever democratic election in 1995, Meles would continue to keep Ethiopia's peasants at the center of his economic policies. We have developed what we call agricultural development-led industrialization program of our country. Uh, that was not necessarily popular or we understood uh, when we uh, embarked on it some 10 years ago. But now people recognize that agricultural prices are going up and are likely to continue to go up over the next decade or two. And that agricultural modernization centered on the small-scale farmer uh, spreads out whatever development benefit there is. Uh, and so, for example, Ethiopia is, uh, however poor we are, we share our, uh, our poverty more equally than anybody in the continent. Uh, and so whatever little grows there is, it's broadly shared. The massive famines of the previous century were brought to an end and a huge program of food security for the country's peasants, known as a safety net program, was rolled out. We have uh, uh, a safety net program throughout the country uh, and so those uh, that uh, are unable uh, to feed themselves as a result of their own effort are provided with uh, assistance in return for uh, doing some work uh, in the community and in their own farms. So they may be engaged in rural uh, road development programs and they will be paid for their work. Uh, we call it a productive safety net program because uh, people have to work for it in order to get the safety net, but they're guaranteed that they will be paid. Uh, so that has reduced the number of people who need uh, emergency assistance. Uh, seven, eight million people uh, get benefit from the safety net program uh, throughout the country and, and in the ground. <laughs> but bringing the countryside into the 21st century was a slow expensive business we have uh, an emergency reserve uh, food uh, 
here in, in country. So if there's an emergency, we don't have to wait for food to arrive from abroad. We take from the emergency reserve and, and provide the food assistance to those who need it. Meles defied the international community by placing the peasantry and the countryside at the center of his policies. A move that led to much unhappiness and criticism of him from the cities. That criticism seems to me uh, misplaced. He believed that Ethiopia is a diverse society. You know, there are diverse religions, diverse ethnic groups, diverse economic interests prevailing in the country. So he believed that no single party will satisfy these people. No single ideology or no single political alternative will satisfy this public. This is the first thing. So based on the diversity, he said to himself and to his party that we have to nurture diversity and allow diversity to ex be expressed in any form. Dissatisfaction in the cities also spread to outlying areas where minorities felt excluded. The Amhara were not happy. The Oromo were not happy. The Somalis weren't happy. But to the outside world, Ethiopia and Ameles appeared to be on a road, albeit a bumpy one, to modernity. In 2005, opposition parties in the cities united against Meles, shocking his ruling party to the core. When election results were contested, the opposition took to the streets and a violent crackdown saw opposition members killed, jailed or exiled. Particularly after 2005 elections, he's more known to, to, to the, to the dissident, dissident circles uh, of Ethiopians that are by large the, the, in diaspora right now, and also to many political opposition parties known to be a very a merciless um, an autocrat, you know, he, who has so little patience and uh, accommodation to, to any, you know, dissidents that were happening. Sedali Lema is a media entrepreneur and one of the few independent media owners in Addis Ababa. Internationally, he was indisputably uh, um, a very shrewd politician that's known um, not only in, in the continent in Africa but also outside of the continent uh, for his unwavering um, support to peace and security in the Horn of Africa and his insistent, his diplomatic skills are indisputably one of the best. So he has two different personalities and, and hence the contention about who he really was. Change in Ethiopia's urban centers has sped up. Opening up of the private sector has resulted in a flood of business activity in the cities. A sense of optimism led Asa Levich to return to Addis Ababa where she has set up a store selling fashion items. She has no doubts of the country's bright future. We have many resources, so we're going to be number one at 10 years time. Perhaps history will be kind to Meles in the sense that it will understand that Ethiopia's journey was not to be concluded in May 1991 but that the road was a longer one and that some of the economic developments that we now see taking place in Ethiopia and across the region are things that had to be worked towards and that those economic benefits will eventually feed through into the creation of a healthier civil society and a healthier democracy. He really worked very hard, sacrificed all his time, his youth, everything for elevation of the, to elevate the country from poverty. He has been able to save Ethiopia from uh, being forced to swallow neoliberal prescriptions and moved it through developmental democratic directions to where we are now. With the peasantry protected from drought for nearly three decades, Addis Ababa booming, his political power rock solid, where would Meles turn his attention next? 
to exporting his ideas to the rest of Africa through the idis based African Union? But he was not to get this opportunity. <laughs> Meles Zanawi died after being hospitalized in Belgium on August 20th, 2012. The death of Meles Zanawi at just 57 came as a shock, both to Ethiopians and to the outside world, and caused an outpouring of grief both profound and unexpected. The rare challenge and the selflessness that we all feel the magnitude of the gap he has left. Not far from the Zenawi family home, in the old town of Adwa, a deep sense of sadness lingers. Sesen Zenawi is Meles's sister. Ten years older than him, he was always her little brother. Melas <laughs> kenal kalana, kaf zinara kunatat, memelas kaf tsubu zinara, magdinar, alis kana mrai. Melas malat, memelas tsubu laut memsa, namalis man. I feel very proud because he was very generous. He was not corrupted, and he died for the because he was not living for himself. He was living for others, and was the way he passed, and I'm very proud of him.